disrupt aging. Sounds a bit ominous, doesn't it? We're going to learn what that means, so stay tuned. We have two phenomenal guests today who are talking all over the state about disrupt aging. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Paula. Thanks how are you for doing? Oh, good. absolutely. Hi, Heather. How are you? Good morning. Dr. Thank you. Heather Renter. <laughs> I'm um, fine, thanks. <laughs> good. Good to have you with us. Before we get into what we're talking about when we say disrupt aging, it, the name just sounds. Tell us what it means. Right. It's a question of what what is disrupt right. aging and. We know that ageism is the last socially accepted ism in our society, mm -hmm. and so disrupt aging is about breaking the stereotype of aging. It's interrupting the outdated beliefs that we have and really changing the conversation mm -hmm. to present older adults instead of in a state of decline and, and slowness, that they still have a lot of vitality and a lot to offer our society. So it's about kind of breaking the old mold and the mm -hmm. old outdated beliefs and redirecting the conversation. And that's so important for a, a multi multitude of reasons. It's important for business, it's important for families, it's important for our general public. I mean, businesses understand the value that an older adult has in the workplace, at home, everywhere. And so how are we disrupting aging here at AARP? And I know that you've been working very closely with Dr. Heather uh, here to talk about disrupt aging, not only in Grand Rapids, but throughout the entire state. So tell us some of the things that are going on. So we met about 10 years ago uh, through GBSU when they had the GBSU, Art, Grand, Valley, Grand State. Valley State University when they were uh, doing the Art and Science of Aging Conference. And so we worked together on planning this and that's all about vitality, all about making uh, people feel good about their age and educating people. And then as a professor, she had invited me into her classroom to teach the Disrupt Aging classroom curriculum to help college students understand how their careers would intersect with older adults and again dispelling some of the myths and outdated beliefs that people have and so if we can start at the ground level early with the young adults then hopefully we can have a better impact down the road with people you know trying to just feel good about their age. And people going into healthcare, to nursing, uh, master work, social sciences, any of those professions need that intersection between mm -hmm what they're learning in school and also older adults. So why did you invite Jennifer in and to, why did you want your students to know about ageism? Well, you thank you, for, Paula, for mm -hmm. that because I did, I did teach in the health sciences. So we're trying to grow um, health professionals that are interested in wanting um, to work with older adults, not only competent to do so, but actually interested in working with older adults. So typically in a classroom, if I were to ask students, you know, how many of you are interested in working in a nursing home, long-term care, in an, in an organization like AARP, um, trying to change policy, um, people would get excited about like the changing policies and doing advocacy work, but when you started talking about older adults, they'd be like, eh, no. I'd, or I wanna be a pediatric nurse, or I wanna work in a youth um, organization as a public health professional. Um, so I wanted to bring a positive spin um, and show all of the advantages that can be had from working with an older adult population. And Jennifer has so much enthusiasm, knowledge, experience in doing that. <laughs> um, so having her in the classroom was, was a natural choice. Um, <clears throat> and to bring a curriculum like Disrupt Aging to the classroom and to do it with someone that's not me, right? To get, get myself away from this out of the front of the classroom and have somebody else who actually works in this field and can speak to all of the amazing things that happen when you work with older adults. So that was yeah. an easy I, choice. I applaud <laughs> you for doing that. I wish more <laughs> professors and colleges and universities would do that as well because it's so critical that young people understand that growing old is not a curse, it's a blessing. You know, it beats the alternative certainly, right? And, and in terms of everyone's going to interact with someone who's older at some point in your life, regardless of the profession, regardless of what profession you're in. Uh, AARP has a program called Experience for Hire, where employers are trying to hire older adults. But what we do is we make certain that the employer, when they go onto the database to, to sign up, that they're gonna be friendly toward older adults. You know, So if someone with gray hair comes in uh, versus someone who is you know, 20 years old or 24, 26, the nat natural in inclination for a lot of employers, not all, is to hire the younger person, right? Even though the other person has more experience, they've been around longer, but they just 
And that's, that's ageism, that's the age discrimination mm -hmm. piece. And it still exists today, whether people want to admit it or not, it still exists. So what the work you're doing help, helps to dispel that, not only for employers, but also for educators and for in the classroom and other places. Give us some examples of Jennifer, uh, ageism, what you've noticed, what you've Yeah, witnessed. so there's there's three types of ageism. So there's the internal, which is the belief system that we hold on to, where it's like, oh, I, I'm too old for that, or I'm having a senior moment. You've then never you, heard me say that, have you? I, never. <laughs> <laughs> but the negative things that we say right. to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then there's the interpersonal, where it's, you know, between two people, where it's like, oh, you look good for your age, oh. right? Just kind of condescending. Mm -hmm. And then there's the institutional, which occurs in the workplace. It occurs in politics, right? We hear that conversation a lot right now right. and uh, in healthcare especially too there's a lot of ageism that exists in healthcare absolutely and even uh, in greeting cards talk absolutely. a little bit about some of the work that you've done with the greeting cards I thought found that so fascinating yeah. I love what you did so with the disrupt aging classroom I had modified it from taking it from a college level to a high school level because I was invited into a local high school in a sociology class to talk about ageism in sociology and I modified the the, the curriculum to make it a little user friendly for high school students. And so one of the activities that we have them do is to create age positive greeting cards because we know the Maxine greeting cards and all the negative things and the jokes and everything. And uh, so by creating new greeting cards with a an age positive or age friendly message, these students can see the difference. And then these greeting cards, then we send them out to volunteers, AARP volunteers um, throughout the state. I love that. And then those those cards, when you see the, the old card versus the new card, you mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. how people will just perpetuate uh, right. what getting older really means and what it, what it looks like. Did you notice a change after you started introducing the curriculum? Uh, did you notice any change in attitudes with your students? Sure, and I think the first thing it does that it's most immediately obvious <clears throat> is to change the conversation. Mm -hmm. So in having those conversations with students and even saying like, hey, next week we're going to have this amazing speaker here mm -hmm. and here's their background and here's what they're going to talk about around aging and disrupt aging and students don't seem that enthusiastic. There's not a whole lot of, you know, interest oh, yeah, there, right. right? Yeah. Front row um, seat. Woo yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then the thing I, one of the many things that I really appreciate about that curriculum and so much of it packed into a short, mm -hmm. you know, this isn't like a whole semester long mm -hmm. or a whole even, you know, sometimes not even a whole class period mm -hmm. long, depending on the length of the classes. Um, but there, there's something in there for everyone. Mm -hmm. So um, I remember Jennifer talking about um, how much of every dollar goes, you know, is spent in the United States that comes out of the pocket of an older adult and how Economic much. Economic impact. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have students um, who might be int really interested in the economic piece mm -hmm. or, you know, business innovation mm -hmm. and like, how do I reach a large population? How do I get those dollars? <laughs> right. Um, so, um, you know, I'm always focused on the health piece and wellness mm -hmm. and health promotion. Um, but if that's not your thing, mm -hmm. there's something in there for everyone that really, um, sparks the conversation so yeah absolutely um when jennifer leaves the room <laughs> and she's on her way down the hall mm -hmm. and we have that time left we, we can always come back to it there's mm -hmm. always conversation around it and i think um i have had students tell me you know like do you remember when we talked about disrupt aging last mm -hmm. year because we're cohorted so students would have mm -hmm. multiple um, classes with me in some cases um, and it's something that sticks with them and i think mm -hmm. it's that feeling and that recognition of like, wow, I'm not, like my generation mm -hmm. isn't on its own. Like we've, there's history and there's people behind us and um, the cohesiveness of those generations, I think, which is hard to find sometimes. I love what, you, what you're sharing <laughs> in terms of how it impacts everybody, regardless. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just ask someone, do you have a grandmother? Mm -hmm. you, know, you didn't get here without a mother. Right. Most people didn't get here without a mother. I don't think anyone yeah. got here without a mother. So it, it, they're gonna age, they're gonna get, oh, how do you want them to be seen and to be viewed and to be talked about? Then you go to the, the elected official or the business person, you talk about the longevity of a person, the financial impact, economic impact of someone staying in the community versus going to another state and what they contribute to give back to the community, but people aren't having those conversations. Um, and just as a point of information, we're going to be having some salon dinners. We're going to be talking about that coming up very shortly with business people, the longevity piece of the financial impact, the business case for longevity. <laughs> so that's a critical piece. Jennifer, you've been doing this. This is something that just resonated with you from the very beginning, ever since Joanne Jenkins first introduced the, the disrupt aging concept in the book and all of that. What attracted you to this and what have you learned? 
So I had my own personal story of ageism and age discrimination. Years ago, I had gotten my degree in broadcasting and I had tried to get my foot back in the door at a TV station and at the age of 31 years old, I was told I was too seasoned to be on TV. At 31 years old, and I thought, my gosh, this is it, right? My career is already washed up before it's even started. So. There's a personal story that affected me because of it. And, you know, honestly, probably the best thing that could have happened because then I ended up going into the field of gerontology, which is the study being two seasoned and absolutely have a complete, total passion for what I do. And so when this came out, it really resonated because of the, the real stories that people have and how you know, as we get older, especially for women, our society is a lot harder on women than it is for men. When men get gray hair, they're considered distinguished. And when women do, well, we look a little tired and old, and same thing with wrinkles. And so, you know, there's a little bit of a double standard. So if we can change the view and the, the idea of what it looks like to age in America, I'm all about that. And, you know, we were talking about the looks, and along with ageism is the lookism, right? Because if you look younger, you're perceived as being more competent or being, um, you know, just better for the role. And when we start to look older or we look, you know, tired and gray, well, you know, we just maybe look like we're not fit for the role. Right. And uh, yeah, we're done. Yeah, we look tired because we're fighting this anti-aging <laughs> war, right? So, yeah. So to me, I just I, I have a personal stake in this, but also just because I get so excited when I see the light bulbs go off in people when we start talking about this, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, I never thought about this." And, and it's important, like you said, you and I really appreciate what you said too, Jennifer, about your own mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, that oh, I'm not going to put that on because it makes me look too young. Well, what's the problem with that? Or I, right. it's, not, it's not befitting my age. Well, you, I mean, you know me, I'm all ponytails or whatever. People say, cut your hair when you get older yeah. because the older people shouldn't have long hair. Well, hello, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it's, we need to defy that ourselves first and make yes. certain that we do whatever we feel like we need to do, want to do. That's appropriate in the workplace, of course. You know, you're not gonna come in mini skirts or bikinis necessarily in the workplace, <laughs> but you know, whatever is appropriate um, for you, not for someone else, but for you. So what do we need to do? What do people need to know? How do we give, give us two or three things that the employer, uh, individuals and educators should do to help disrupt aging? Let's start with employers. What do they need to do? I think there's fortunately been a very big <coughs> cultural movement and a mm -hmm. lot of cultural inertia around um, civil rights and human rights, mm -hmm. particularly with some of the events that have happened in the last few years. Um, <clears throat> and I also think that the pandemic brought to light a lot of workforce mm -hmm. issues. You know, people with disabilities have been asking and advocating for more flexible work arrangements mm -hmm. um, for decades. Right. And once it happened to all of us and we all were stuck in our homes, we started to, oh yeah, we can do Zoom meetings and we can work from home two days a week or all of these different accommodations. Um, but one of the things I, th I think in all of that um, noise, and I mean that in a positive way, all of that energy that's been raised around these types of issues. Um, one of the things that's often left out of like diversity, equity, inclusion, mm -hmm. and those DEI talks, and mm -hmm. particularly in college campuses, mm -hmm. healthcare campuses, um, is older adults. Mm -hmm. So we have, I think, made a lot of progress and there's still room to improve, but um, a lot of work has been done around recognizing racism and mm -hmm. ableism and a lot of the other right. isms. Um, but as I, as a faculty member, sat in many a classroom um, with other faculty talking about DEI issues and taking DEI classes, at no time in my personal experience was age and older mm -hmm. adults um, mm -hmm. included in that conversation mm -hmm. when we know that there's so many examples of ageism and how destructive it is to ourselves as we grow older um, as well as our population. So for me it's a public health issue that really does really I think is really seated in healthcare or not well healthcare but also in the workforce mm -hmm. because adults work right right and mm -hmm. you know the idea that we retire at 65 <coughs> is kind of become <laughs> you obsolete, know obsolete right, right? Um, so how do people age well and work well and work in intergenerational settings um, and we don't teach students about that so it's I think powerful. that's a, a big place where workplaces as well as institutions that prepare people and retrain people and reskill people um, whatever that might look like um, can start having those conversations and 
<coughs> creating opportunities for intergenerational learning experiences mm -hmm. that go both ways, that are mutually satisfying. That's very powerful. And one of my colleagues here, Melissa Seifert, um, her daughter and her son, sometimes they'll, the school will take them into a senior citizen home or a, a facility and they interact, you know, whether it's puzzles, whether it's coloring or whatever. And when she brings back the pictures, it's just so heartwarming mm -hmm. to see they're learning from each other. You know, you're never too old to learn. You're never too young to learn. Mm -hmm. So that interaction and teaching that. Jennifer, what are you? What are your some suggestions you have for people? I think it starts internally. Uh, there's a lot of study that shows that if you have a, a positive perception of aging, you can actually live up to seven and a half years longer. And so if we start redirecting our thoughts to be that it's about growth and it's about opportunity, getting older is a blessing. It's a good thing. We're still we still have the opportunity to challenge ourselves to check things off the bucket list. And so if we can change the conversation with in ourselves, then we can then change the conversation with other people as well. That's, again, those are very powerful points. You know, with aging though, does come some additional responsibility, right? I mean, many times you're finding people are in that sandwich generation, they're older adults, they're working, they're taking care of their mother or their father or someone, and they're also taking care of kids or grandkids or older adults. And so how would you, in terms of, of ageism and the discrimination, we look at young people sometimes and we think, oh my, you know, they're they're going to um, not miss work. They're not going to. They're going to be there. They're going to be there every day because they're young and they're vital and they're you know they're healthy and all that. But what research has found, to your point, and we've done a ton of research, folks, on this. What it's found is that older <clears throat> adults are much more reliable in the workplace as well. They come to work on time. They stay all day. They don't have to leave for all sorts of other reasons. So they're very reliable, very different, and they help the younger people. And with the drama that, take, that exists in every workplace, there's someone there to talk to. So employers are finding more and more that older adults are really valuable for a lot of additional reasons in addition to their wisdom and skills that they have. They're very valuable in the workplace. Um, and so there are more and more of them are hiring older adults. However, uh, whether you're young or old, you need some caregiving time off, you need some paid leave time off to take care of, whether it's a child, your own child, or whether it's a loved one. Have you have you experienced that as well? I know you had a story too where you were talking about, how they were you talking about that kind of in-between, taking mm -hmm. care of someone that you love and also being in the workplace. Um, but again, even with those responsibilities, older adults are more reliable in the workplace. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I'm not surprised, but it's people don't understand, don't often realize that. I think the other value that older adults have in the workplace that's often overlooked is in institutional knowledge. And that institutional, the, the knowledge of the institutional culture over time. And particularly um, as COVID brought with it, you know, the great resignation, right? Where many people were coming and going and leaving and reskilling and <laughs> moving into other areas. Um, it can be very valuable and sometimes necessary right. Right, to, to achieve um, workplace objectives, organizational workplace objectives when that there's a fragment, fragmentation of what have we done, how did we get here, right? And, and sometimes that's a six month window, but sometimes it's a 60 year window, right? Like when did our values change? How did they, what's our theory of change? What's our culture of change? And so it's people who've been there at the table um, that can answer those questions that quite simply <laughs> other people can't because of they don't have that, that lived experience. So um, oftentimes it's looked at as, well, we need to get rid of the old, older people because they've been here the longest and therefore they make the most money, so they cost us the most money. Um, and that's one way to do the math. <laughs> but if you start doing the math in terms of like someone who wants to get their foot in the door and plans to stay five or 10 years and plans to move into another position elsewhere and you've got the retention and the retainment, the retraining, um, all of those are costs as well that sometimes I think don't, um, it's, it's not apples to apples. Yeah, people don't yeah. think about, <laughs> excuse me, employers don't think about that, right? They don't think about that. They just look at the skill set that they think they need. Oh, well, I can grow this person into the position and they'll stay. People don't stay in, you know, five years, they're gone. You know, they're, they're on to something else. Older adults, when they come in, they generally stay. They're not looking for the next career move. And they have, the, you said, the institutional knowledge that is so valuable. And they can help the younger person or younger people in the workplace as well. I was looking at <coughs> your, your title here, Heather. You are the Director of Education and Research at the Heritage Community of Kalamazoo. Mm -hmm. 
Tell me what you're doing with ageism there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh boy, that's a big question. You've got about two minutes left. Yeah, so um, it's a senior living community. Mm -hmm. And so we have people in memory care, assisted living, independent living, um, and really people from a very broad, um, diverse background. Um, so we have people who are in their 60s and 70s who are in independent living who still work, mm -hmm. who might still be running their own company. Um, and we have people who live in you know, skilled care and memory care that might not have a visit from a family member um, and haven't worked in decades. Um, and one of the things that I see most powerfully to me that really um, pulls my heartstrings is the 60 and 70 year old caregivers um, that are living in the community in the broader community who are caring for a parent mm -hmm. or maybe both parents mm -hmm. who are starting to experience memory loss and maybe some type of dementia, um, which can be very, very tasking. Um, any kind of caregiving requires a lot of mm -hmm. emotional, physical, often financial mm -hmm. support. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and so when you're doing it as a 60 year old or maybe even a 70 year old, um, you're dealing with all of those forces, but you're also dealing with the things that we've just been talking about in the workforce. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're not ready to retire. Maybe there's still some things that you really wanted to do in that last 10 years mm -hmm. that you were planning on working. And now you're having to balance that and mm -hmm. those those lifetime desires and goals that you had as a professional um, with taking care of a parent mm -hmm. um, and maybe dealing with your adult children as well who are also saying right, hey mom right. you need to move into independent living <laughs> we're talking about grandma and memory care but what about you right um, so there's all of these different forces coming at you and I hear people say all the time oh I'm too I'm too old for that mm -hmm. or um, I, I have these goals and these desires but I don't know how to do it mm -hmm. I'd feel like it's my peers see me as you know obsolete um, I need to move on yeah so there's just Points. a lot of this like push and pull I think that oftentimes doesn't get looked at or Point. seen points well taken mm -hmm. thank you so yeah. much for that uh, I still like calling you Dr. Heather but thank you so <laughs> much for that because that's such great advice and Jennifer thank you for just leading the way and charging through to make certain that we all disrupt aging thanks for watching thank you for being here thanks, Paula. Yeah. thank you Driving and giving up driving if you've been independent all of your life is very, very difficult. Thank you for being here to talk about modes of transportation. So tell us a little bit about how to make a decision about whether or not someone should be giving up driving or a loved one in particular. That conversation is a very difficult conversation to have. I've had it with my own mother mm. and uh, she is still driving and almost 90. Um, but oftentimes we find that in a third party, um, trusted person is the best one to have that conversation with your loved one, um, such as a physician. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that can be dependent on how the driver is able to actually conduct the driving experience. Um, the thing about CATA is that we don't want to take away the access to freedom and independence. And so that's the that's what we provide. We remove that barrier and um, allow the driver to continue to have access to services, go to medical appointments, visit with family and friends, so that that quality of life continues to be available to them. And that's so important. And it's not about going to a bus stop and getting on a cat a bus. There are other options for people that are a bit more private and they should explore those options. That's correct. We do have several demand response, curb to curb uh, services that are scheduled in advance for uh, drivers to take advantage of. And do people need to qualify in order to take advantage of those or if uh, they just call or what's the process? Uh, for Spectran, they would need to qualify and there is an application process to that and that application is available at cata.org slash Spectran. It is reviewed by an independent um, third party and that is Disability Network Capital Area. Good organization. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. I'm Dr. Al Schwaf. I'm a rheumatologist at the Great Lakes Centers of Rheumatology. I'm going to talk today about the importance of exercise in patients with rheumatic diseases. Uh, exercise and physical activity are very essential in patients with rheumatic diseases, and it plays an important role in the management of their conditions. Yet, it's estimated only like 25% of patients exercises regularly. The benefits of exercise 
it leads to a significant decline in the disease activity, swollen joint count, pain score, and improves fatigue and physical function. Fatigue is very difficult to manage in patients with rheumatic diseases, but regu exercising regularly would significantly help in these conditions. Some patients ask what type of exercises we should do, and we exercise program should be tailored to the patient's needs, abilities, and preferences. We generally recommend exercising about 10 minutes, starting at 10 minutes of brisk walk, and then increase gradually to about 30 minutes, three to five times a week. Other forms of exercises like stretching, strengthening, resistance exercise, swimming, all would be helpful. Sometimes we even advise patients to, you know, park farther to the store's entrance to exercise. Some questions sometimes say is, if, are the uh, exercise might worsen our diseases? There is no evidence of that. And, uh, and uh, all type of exercises are uh, helpful. Sometimes we just uh, ask them to uh, modify the exercise according to their needs. Hi, Chris. Glad to have you with us again. You know, we talked previously about probate, and if you have a will, you automatically have to go to probate, and if you have a trust, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. What is probate? Yeah. So probate is a court process where basically if you haven't created your own rule book, a comprehensive estate plan, the, the courts have, or the government has a rule book for you. And you could end up in probate while you're alive, as well as when you pass away. For example, let's say you get in a car accident and you've never put together your estate plan and someone needs to make decisions with regards to your care, they're gonna to have to petition the court to become a guardian. And if you happen to have money, they're gonna petition the court to also become a conservator. And the way you avoid that is by having a financial and medical power of attorney. Then also we have probate upon death, and most people are more familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And most people know they wanna avoid it because it's a court process, it's time consuming. By statute, admission goes at least five months. And also it's costly, three to 5% of any assets going through probate get eaten up in fees. Wow, right. so if someone is married, their mm -hmm. spouse does not automatically have a decision about their medical uh, condition or their long-term? Correct, yeah. So there is a situation, Terry Shivo, she was a woman down in Florida. She was in a vegetative state. Her husband wanted to remove her from life support. Her family wanted her to remain. And it became a big court battle that lasted over eight years. She didn't have any medical power of attorney. So yeah, even if you're married or even if you have adult children, you need to put together at least those disability documents, the financial power of attorney and the medical power of attorney to avoid the guardianships and conservatorships. And then they go to probate or the attorney will then file them upon your... Yeah, so that will help you avoid probate. We wanna stay out of probate. And then to avoid probate upon death, we need to understand estate administration. And assets can pass through joint ownership, beneficiary designation, trust, but if it doesn't pass through one of those first three, then it ends up going into probate. And that's what we wanna avoid. So people need to plan so they don't get caught up in all of this. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for watching AARP Real Possibilities. Lots of good information today. Share it with someone. Hopefully it's news that you can use.